Hi everyone, this is Pierre Rick from P2Design with a full length follow along tutorial. It has been requested several times, so here it is, your T-Rex animation tutorial in Blender. And the cool thing is that it's totally free and you can get the rig for free on my website p2designacademy.com. This is a step-by-step -step tutorial, but I assume that you know how to animate in Blender, at least you know the basic tool to animate in Blender. But if it's not the case and you want to learn the fundamental of animation, or push your skills to a professional level, check out my animation course alive. You will find the link in the description. I advise you to follow along, watching 30 seconds to 1 minute, then go back and repeat the process shown. And don't forget to share your animation on social media using the hashtag P2Design. Let's get started. The first thing you want to do is to get the character rig. Go to p2designacademy.com and search for the free rigs. You can have those rigs for free or pay a $15 support fee. Once in there, in the Tyrex section, just choose Rig Download and follow the instructions. The whole rig is explained in the T-Rex presentation video. Opening the file, you should have this presentation. So we will collapse the text editor as we don't want it. And I will also push the outliner on the properties panel as we won't be using them. In the rig UI, I will hide some of the controllers that we won't be using. For this animation, I think it's gonna be easier to use inverse kinematic for the hands or the arm of the character. So I will hide the forward kinematic controllers of the arm. I can also hide most of the tweaker bone for the time being, as we won't be using them at the beginning. And I will duplicate my king set animation. This way, we start with a neutral pose but with all our controllers properly keyed. I will rename it Walk and then I will go to the Preferences and make sure that in the Animation tab, the only insert available is enabled. This way, Blender will insert keyframes only on the controllers and custom properties that already have a key. And this is why I created this first action keying for you. Only the needed transform channel are keyed and it will keep your Blender file clean. If you want to identify your controllers based on their group color, just enable the channel group colors in the preferences. I personally prefer not to work with it. The head can be controlled by a forward kinematic or an invert kinematic controller. I will use the invert kinematic. By default, this controller is parented to the torso root or center of gravity and I will keep it as is for the time being. I gathered a few references that you should have a look at. While the leg motion might be obvious, look at how the torso bounces, that's super important. And look at the stability of the head. And yes, this is not a Tyrex, but a lot of scientists think that birds have a lot in common with dinosaurs. They have a very close bone structure, bone properties, like hollow bones. You should also have a look to this sequence from Jurassic World, The Fallen Kingdom. It's great to have a sense of pace and weight on the character. Don't worry, you will find all the links in the video description. The last reference I have is an animation done by Brendan Buddy. He's a seasoned animator, instructor at iAnimate, specialized in creature animation. And we'll be using a lot of his principle to communicate weight and scale for this animation. Check out his webpage for awesome animation tips. First thing first, I want to animate at 24 frames per second, not 30. So I will change that in the document properties. For this kind of animation, I like to use a mix of layered animation and simple blocking. We will create the animation of the legs and the torso root, and based on this, we will animate the other parts of the dinosaur. So I will select the feet controller and the torso controller, and I will press Shift H to hide everything else. From there, I will create the first pose, the contact pose. And I will start with the left leg, so I will move the left leg forward and the right leg backward. This is a moment where the weight of the character is falling downward, so I will slightly push the character down toward the supporting leg, the front leg. Don't push the offset too much, as this is not the most extreme pose for this controller. If I now check my timeline, my character will reset its pose, because I'm not recording what I'm doing. 
So I will press Ctrl Z to undo that. I will check and enable the auto king and I will add a keyframe on all my controller on the first frame. If I now switch to front view, that will be better to slightly tighten the feet. The faster you animate a walk or a run, the tighter will be the feet onto a centered line. But since your creature is pretty heavy, you want to keep a large stance. So I just offset the feet by 0.2 unit toward the inside. All right, let's move on to the next pose. I will arbitrarily jump to frame five as I absolutely don't care about timing at this stage. And I will insert a keyframe on all controllers. I will select all the keys with A and press T and switch to constant interpolation, also known as depth. I will bring the front leg back just beneath the center of gravity of our character and I will push the torso or the center of gravity up and slightly toward the other leg. But I will keep it beneath the supporting leg. Now we'll bring the other leg more or less at the same level, but I will raise it so that it doesn't touch the ground. I will press Alt H to expose all the controllers as I will mainly use the foot roll mechanism to rotate the foot forward. From there, we need to pose the fingers. I will first select the outer palm bone and slightly rotate it backward. Then I will select all the palm bones. I will switch my rotation mode to local and I will press R to rotate and rotate along the X axis to curve them back. Then I will select the curl bone that allows us to curl all the fingers at once and rotate them also back along the X axis. The foot animation is going to be one of the most important for this walk because a lot happened here. Now that my foot is posed, I will raise it so that it doesn't clip with the ground and I feel like I need to push the torso a little upward and more onto the supporting leg. I will also add a bit of rotation toward the supporting leg as it's trying to raise the right leg. Now that we have those two poses, we can almost create all the poses. Just a little tip, you made me see hiding and re-enabling all the controllers. I'm just toggling the overlays by pressing Shift-Alt-Z. So now, on frame zero, I will select all my controllers with A, press Ctrl-C, I will go to frame 10 and press Ctrl-Shift-V to paste the mirror pose. From there, I will select all the keys on frame zero by selecting the first on the top in the summary, press Shift-D and move it on frame 20. And then I will copy the pose on frame 5 and press Ctrl Shift V to paste it mirrored on frame 15. Then I can go on frame 20 and press Ctrl End in the action editor. This will set the end of the action or the timeline. And when I hit play, I can start to see my current walk cycle. So what I felt with the cycle as it is, is that during the passing pose, the center of gravity is a bit too much forward. So I will adjust the pose on frame five and then just re-mirror the pose on frame 15. Let's spline the foot motion. Before I switch to spline, I did a little timing pass off camera and it feels better to have this cycle over 50 frames, at least for the moment. So I will scale my keys to distribute them over 50 frames. Now I will select all my keys, press T and switch to busy interpolation and press V and make sure that everything is in auto clamped. So now I can see Blender automatically interpolating my animation. Not too shabby, but really not good. I will start by working on the left foot. I will select it, press Shift H to hide everything else and switch to the graph editor by pressing Ctrl tab. I won't be animating the rotation yet, so I will hide everything but the location channel. The first thing I want is to make sure that my foot travels slower on the ground than when it's leaving the ground. The foot forward motion is driven by the Y location curve. I want the foot to travel slower while on the ground, so I will offset frame 25 on frame 30 for the time being. When you are working on the walk or run cycle, you want any point contacting the ground to move at a linear speed. So I will delete any key in between, select the two keys at the extremities of this contact pose and press V and switch to vector. Now I need to offset the moment the foot leave the ground. The up and down motion is driven by the Z curve, so I will offset the Z curve and also switch its interpolation to vector. Now, as the foot leaves the ground, I don't want it to go up and forward directly. I want it to 
kind of have a bit of overshoot backward. So I can do this by aligning the Y curve with the last point before it leaves the ground. I want it to slowly accelerate forward as it pulls its leg. I don't know, by the way, I don't know if it's a he or a she. So let's call the Tyrex Bob. And I will soften the verticality of the Y curve so that the foot moves forward a little slower. Now we need to work on the Z location curve. So basically I want the leg to raise not too much and then it will raise a little more before it hits the ground like super fast. Since Bob is heavy, he has a hard time pulling his leg off the ground. And when it's the time to pull it back onto the ground, he does it super fast. This is why I will switch the contacting frame to vector so that we have a hard angle on our curve. Then I will push the higher point a little further, closer to the moment of impact. So basically the foot will lose altitude super fast. I want a bit of an overshoot of the foot forward. As it's moving forward, I will rotate the curve so that it will go further forward and at the moment that it will touch the ground, it will be moving backward, basically. The idea is to really feel the stomp the moment it touched the ground. So you need the foot to fall pretty fast. Now, when you are animating a walk cycle, you need to make sure that you use the less energy possible to raise the feet. So in the beginning, I will try to keep the foot as close to the ground as possible. I mean, you don't try to raise your knees as high as possible unless you're into a crossfit training or whatever. So try to keep the feet not too high and in the end I'm just raising it a bit so that we have a nice stomp, a nice impact. Once the finger will be animated it will really feel better, don't worry. Now you should always check your motion using the motion path. So you will go to the amateur's properties, go to motion path, set your frame range and then calculate. I personally added it to my quick favorite by right clicking on the button and choosing add to quick favorite. And this is what my motion path looks like. One thing a lot of animators forget to animate is the side motion of the foot during a walk cycle. So I don't know if it's going to be accurate because I don't have a reference for that, but I feel like the character should be pushing inward, that the foot is pushing toward the inside and then during the passing pose, the foot will go slightly on the outside before it touches the ground. While on the ground, you want a straight X location. You don't want it to slide side to side. But then as it leaves the ground, I want it to go slightly toward the inside. And then during the passing pose, slightly toward the outside. So I will kind of have a S shaped curve. And then I will zoom on my curve to reduce the amplitude of the curve. So I don't want a super broad side to side motion. It has to be subtle, but it just brings a bit of believability to the motion, I guess. Now I'd like to mirror the action onto the other foot, even though it's not finished, just to have a better feeling about it. So I will first make it cycle by selecting all the curve, pressing Shift E and choose Make Cycle. Now with all my curves selected, I will press Ctrl C to copy all those keys. In the 3D view, I will unhide all the controllers, select the opposite foot, and then I will get rid of all the keys but the first one. I will select them all and press Ctrl Shift V to paste a mirrored curve. Now Bob is doing small jumps, so I will offset all those keys by 25 frames. And then I will duplicate them back to create some kind of cycle. And I will insert a key on the very first frame on all channels and convert them to free. Duplicate those on frame 50 and get rid of all the keys after frame 50 and before frame zero. This is how you kind of clamp your animation length in a way. While recording, I spotted that I offset the curve by 24 frames instead of 25. But I fixed that on left foot basically a little later on. I didn't notice why but it felt better on the right foot and I fixed it on the left foot. But now it feels like the animation is a bit too slow so I select all the curve and make them cycle pressing shift E. Now I will switch back to the action editor and I will scale down the whole keys toward the point zero. Basically I'm making the action shorter so the animation a little faster and it feels better to me at least on 40 frames. 
the length of the action is really up to you. I felt like 50 frames was a bit too slow, but it also feels like super heavy. That's really hard to, to get the timing right uh, at this stage. So as I explained before, on the left foot, I will simply offset the landing pose by one frame. So I will push the up pose of the foot by one frame, one frame later. So it takes only three frame for the foot to land on the ground, which is the case on the right foot since I did this little mistake. Now, if we polish a bit the foot roll, it will really change the feeling of this walk cycle. So with my foot roll controller selected, I will press Shift H to hide everything else and I will start working on the graph editor. I will deal with it as I will do with a human foot. But then with the finger, we will add this kind of bird motion. So here I'm raising uh, the fingers, but this is not rotating around the heel of the foot, but around the ball of the foot. So I push the key down to raise the fingers, but I want to slap them on the ground pretty fast, on frame one or two. As you want to slam the ball on the ground, you switch your key to vector. This way you get rid of any easing. Then I will duplicate the first key on the very last frame, and I will make Bob pushing onto his foot a little sooner by duplicating this key to have a more flat curve on the top. So it will be raised a little longer. Then I want to make sure that he open the foot a little more while the foot is going down on the ground. So this is where the finger curling will kind of get into the other direction. It will make sense when we start animating the fingers. And the time is more or less now. So what I will do is that I will press Alt H to unhide every controller. I will select the palm controllers and the finger curling controllers. And for the time being, we will focus only on the X rotation. So press Alt H to unhide everything, select the bone you want to use, and then we will press Shift H again. And to isolate the X rotation channel, I will go to the search bar and type in X space EU for X Euler and only the channel with the name X EU will appear, the X Euler rotation basically. So let's polish those fingers. First, I need them to be in contact with the ground. I don't want them to go through the ground. So I will offset their X rotation curve until the foot leave the ground. And then I will tweak them to keep them in contact with the ground as long as possible. So it's not really about moving the curve or whatever. I'm using the graph editor because it's easier. I can work with chunks. So I'm duplicating the curve and per frame, I'm offsetting the curve to have visually in my 3D viewport, the fingers that seems to be in contact with the Y line, which represents my ground level in a way. So I'm using the graph editor, but I'm basically building pose to pose animation here. Then once the foot leaves the ground, I can curl the fingers back as a follow through animation. I will then go back and revise a bit the position of each fingers on the ground. So I will try my best to reach the best result I can using only the curling controller. And then I will unhide all the controller and play with the tweaker bones, the individual joints of the fingers. Here I've reached this limit where I can't really get the result I want with those main controllers. So I will switch with the tweaker bone. I will rotate it. You can see that it's interpolating over five frames. I don't want that. So on the previous frame, I will cancel the rotation by pressing Alt R. And then I will smooth the curve so that the controller doesn't pop by offsetting the next keyframe. As the foot travels fast in the air, I want the pound bone to slightly curve backward, again as a follow through animation. And I will do the same with the curling uh, controllers. As explained before, I dealt with the contacting pose a bit as a human foot, but it doesn't feel right. Whenever a chicken or a big bird, or if you watch other dinosaur references in movies or stuff like that, they tend to land uh, on the ball of the foot, not on what I interpreted as a heel, so it doesn't feel right. So I will try to absorb the impact with the fingers a bit, but still have a bit of slapping rotation of the fingers. It's a bit 
subtle, it's a bit complex to explain. So just follow along, try to, to get a sense of the motion basically. So here I'm almost at the contacting point and I'm making the fingers pointing down while I was planning to make them point up as your toes will do whenever you are walking. So now when I switch to frame 40, the contacting pose, you can see that the palm bones are pointing up a bit too much. So I will lower their curve and it will uh, reduce their rotation and make them point toward the ground. And it feels a little more natural. I still want to have a bit of this slapping motion, like this impact on the ground. I will just speed up this part of the animation because this is where I was kind of exploring this slapping motion on the ground and it doesn't feel right at all. And this is what is hard about doing animation tutorial is that sometime you need to explore some stuff and it doesn't work so you need to revise them afterward. So here I choose to show you the whole process because I don't want you to feel like hey you did something, I didn't see it. So you see the whole thing here. You see my mistake and you see how now I'm trying to fix it. So basically I'm fixing it by going back onto the foot roll controller and make sure that our friend Bob doesn't land too harshly on the ground, that there is a bit of absorption with the fingers. And then I will spend quite a lot of time on the first two or three frames working on each joint of the fingers to make sure that they are in contact with the ground, that we feel like they are absorbing uh, the impact. So I will just pose them Y by one. I will use their rotation, but also their location. It's totally fine to kind of break the rig a bit because your fingers doesn't rotate along a simple axis. If you look at your fingers, for example, joint, they do rotate, but they also slightly slide around their joint. You can't see it because you will need X-ray. But what I mean by, by that is that there is a bit of rotation, but also a bit of translation. So that's totally fine to use that at your advantage during your animation. What I don't want is my finger to go through the ground too much or to be floating above the ground too much. It's okay to have a bit of clipping with the ground if at some point you set a plane to materialize the ground, it will feel okay if the, the fingers are kind of clipping with it, while if they are floating upon the ground, it won't look okay. So here you can see I have a bit of popping in my fingers. I will just go frame by frame to get rid of it and get a smoother interpolation. Here I'm just accelerating a little bit uh, the video because it's pretty long. Uh, I will be like fine tweaking each finger. So as I told you before, I want them to be contacting the ground. Uh, so I will make sure that they are properly rotated. They are properly offsetted. I'm only working, I think, with the very last joint, basically. So that's pretty fast, but it's not super interesting to uh, speak over that or there is nothing to explain, but hey, tweak your bones or tweak the pose so that it looks right. Now I'd like to bring some extra details that will really push this foot animation to the next level. I want the fingers to spread a bit when they are in contact with the ground. So one thing that will probably demystify a bit animation for you is that I did rig this character so I more or less know how it behaves, but sometimes I don't. So I just take a curve, I move it and see what happens on screen and check if this is the right behavior I want. It was not the case with the X location. So now I will try the Z rotation and see if it does spread the fingers and it does. So I know that I need to use this curve. So now what I will do is that after the contact pose, I will take like about two frames to open a little more the finger. And I will hold that pose until the foot is uh, released from the weight of the character. So basically, 
as the foot start to leave the ground, I will just uh, reset this rotation. Spreading the fingers a little more while the weight is on the current foot will uh, bring this extra detail that uh, really feels more natural. So I will just add a key in between and push it slightly down to slightly open the, the finger a little more. It's barely noticeable, but it will make it more natural as the pose won't hit a wall like I'm transitioning to a new pose and the pose is locked. It will still be moving in a way. Now I can repeat the process on the outer palm bone. So I will simply open a bit uh, the pinky or this finger, I don't know how to call it, uh, while the foot is still on the ground. And as it will leave the ground, I will uh, reset the pose. Now I can see that, I don't know why, maybe I posed it by mistake, but it was a bit too open uh, while the foot was raised, so I'm just fixing that by setting the curve value to zero. Now it really feels more natural. Now I just need to work on, on this finger. So I will simply animate the curling bone that will be enough. And I just want to add a bit of shaking and a bit of follow through animation to this bone as the foot is moving. So by looking at it a bit closer, it feels like it's really curved inward, like too much, as if it was contracted. I think that's something I posed during the blocking stage, that's perfectly fine. I will simply raise the curve a little bit to relax the bone in a way, or relax this finger. And I will create the follow through animation, so basically when the foot is moving back, I will slightly raise the thumb. And as the foot is moving forward, the thumb will be dragging backward. Then it's a matter of distance between the keys here. My curve is very smooth, so I won't even notice uh, the different poses because it's interpolating during the whole animation. So I offset the keys so that I have a bigger change between frame 25 and 32, and it feels a little more natural. Now, as the foot is falling down, I will raise the thumb as it's dragging and I will uh, duplicate the pose on the opposite side and then I will create a bouncing motion. So I will create a zigzaggy curve that will soften over time. I will slightly accelerate the video now on this part because I'm just experimenting, I'm just trying some different amplitude of this sinusoidal shape for the curve that will bring this kind of bounciness in the sum as it's reacting to the impact on the ground. And eventually I got uh, this specific curve and eventually I ended with this curve where I can see the bounce of the sum and it feels okay to me. So instead of trying to find which bone was animated or not, I would select my whole left side, copy the keys, select all the bone on the right side, delete all the keys but the very first one, and then select them all and pressing Ctrl Shift V. We get our super jumping bob. To fix that, I will select all the keys of the right side, press Shift D, duplicate them and offset them by 40 frames. Note that I'm almost always using the show only selected option for my curves. So it will show me only the curve from the bones that are selected. So now with all my right foot curve selected, I will offset them by 20 frames to the left, back in time basically. Now I will select a keyframe on all the controllers on frame 0. Then I will select those keys, press V and switch their handle type to 3. Now I can get rid of all the keys before frame 0. I will select all the keys on frame 0, press Shift D and 40 to duplicate them on frame 40 and get rid of all the keys after frame 40. And now we are done with our foot animation. We can jump onto the torso animation. So we will start with the up and down and side to side motion. So I will select my torso root and I will isolate the location channels. I did a little mistake there by isolating the Z location and X location because the up and down motion is driven by the Y location channel. Not a big deal as I will start with the side to side motion. So the X location channel. A very common mistake is to make the extreme of the torso or center of gravity to be in sync or synchronized with the contact pose. 
but you want to offset that in time. First, the foot contact the ground, and then the weight continue to travel over the contacting foot. And then the foot will push the body the other direction, the opposite direction. So in my graph editor, since the contact frame is on frame zero, I'm offsetting the extreme left pose of the torso on frame three. And then I'm holding the pose or I have a slow transition to the right between frame four and frame 12. Bob is pushing on his leg to bring his weight onto the other side. And then as he falls down, I will have a fast transition onto right leg and I will repeat the same mechanism or the same profile of the curve, but on the opposite side. So this is the main profile of the X location curve. I will slightly tweak it and then start working on the up and down. So here I was trying with the Z location curve and it felt strange and I realized it was not the right channel. So I just switch, hide the Z location channel and enable the Y location channel. What you really don't want when you're working on such a heavy character is to have this pure sinusoidal shape in your up and down curve. What I mean by that is that you should have a slow paced raising as the character is pushing to raise the opposite leg. And as it falls down, as it is very heavy, it should go very fast. Also, since there are two steps into a cycle, the up and down curve will repeat itself over 20 frames. It's like you have two cycles of the up and down within our 40 frame cycle. The up pose should be a couple of frames after the passing pose. This is the moment where you really push forward, basically. So this is where your body is getting as high as possible. And this is where both bodies should do the same. And then look how I try to slow down uh, the fall on frame 20, the contacting pose. But then I wanted to accelerate after the contacting pose. Because once your foot contact the ground, you're kind of releasing the weight from the other foot. And so your leg has to support the whole weight and you fall down even like lower. Then you will push to be able to raise the opposite leg, the one that was supporting the weight basically. So what you want to remember is that when you are doing a walk cycle, your down pose is not on the contacting pose. And the heavier the creature you're trying to animate, the later the down pose will be reached after the contacting pose. So I'm spending a bit of time refining those curves. What I don't want to is to get my down pose and my extreme side to side pose to happen at the same time, which is the case right now. I want to hit the down pose before the extreme side pose. So basically my character is going down and reach the down pose, but he's still traveling to the right or the left, depending on the foot that just contacted. So this is what I'm doing right now. You can see that I'm reworking my side to side curve to be able to offset it maybe by one or two frame and so that the extreme down pose is not aligned with it. So now my extreme down is on frame 23 and the extreme right on frame 26. And then I will make sure that I have some kind of the same profile for my curve on uh, the left side, basically. To summarize, your down pose is a couple of frames or three frames after the contact pose, and your extreme side pose is a couple of frames after the down pose. From there, the result was decent, but I felt like I had some kind of V shape in my motion path. And what I like when I'm viewing the motion path from the front view of my torso root is to have more like an eight shape, something that loop nicely. Here you can see the result I had after revising my X curve. So now let's switch to side view and work on the back and forth motion. I always struggle a bit with this one because it doesn't feel natural, especially when you are animating a walk cycle on place or a static walk cycle if you want. But basically when your character is pushing forward or up, you should bring back the center of gravity and as it falls forward, 
you should bring it forward. And just try to keep this motion pretty smooth. The idea is to make sure that your character looks balanced from the side view. Also, one pitfall that can happen when you're working like that with the layered animation approach. So basically, we are layering details of animation one after the other by polishing each controller separately, that you may feel like you're lacking details in the motion right now. So you want to push it further. But don't forget that we will animate the chest, the head, the hips. And this is going to bring a lot of details in the animation and a lot more visual noise and texture to our animation that will make it feel more lively. So for this side view, I'm not going like into a super contrasted uh, curve shape. I don't want a crazy contrast uh, in this back and forth motion. Maybe I will change it later on, but for the time being, uh, it feels safer to keep it smooth like that. Take the time to watch your animation and turn around your character. It's important to be satisfied with what you're doing. Don't forget that satisfaction drives your motivation. We will now work on the rotation of the center of gravity. We'll start with the left to right rotation. This is our base curve. And I just want to bring a bit of contrast. So basically when the character has his weight on one leg, he will be leaning or rotating toward the leg. And then we have the weight transfer that should be pretty fast from one leg to the other. Here you can see the motion I'm currently working on. So what you could think about is that since the character is very heavy, think that he's a bit drunk. So when his weight is transferring onto a foot, he will rotate toward the foot a bit and he will hold this rotation for a while and then rotate the opposite way super fast. Don't push the curve too much. You don't want to bring too much rotation because we will be adding rotation in the chest, the head, the hips. So keep this torso controller pretty subtle when it comes to rotation. From there, we can switch to the X rotation channel. So it's the up and down that will drive the chest and the head, basically. I advise you to keep this rotation super subtle again because we will be adding more motion using the chest controller. And if you bring too much rotation in this controller, it won't feel natural. It will feel like your character is losing control because his head is moving too much in space. Now, motion-wise, with a slight offset in time, you want the torso or the chest of the character to point up whenever he's falling down, and you want it to lean forward whenever he's pushing on the legs. Also, as the up and down motion, this motion will be repeated twice over a full cycle because you will have this motion for each step. I don't have that much to add to this, so I will just accelerate a bit the video. A slight plateau when the character is leaning forward after the down pose and when he's pushing on the legs, and then a smooth bump while he's going down. Let's now switch to the hips. I will first use rotation and I first want to animate the vertical rotation of the hips that will allow to bring the leg forward and backward basically. Since I don't know what channel to use, I will just try a couple of them until I find the right one and it's the Y channel. The hips are generally leading the motion, especially when it comes to the legs. So the hips will pull the legs forward. So what I want to do is to rotate the hips toward the front foot. So basically, I'm just reducing the distance between the foot and the hips. That's pretty straightforward. But what I will do is that I will give my curve a bit of acceleration when I'm switching side, just to give the impulse to pull the foot from the ground. This is why I'm adding a key on frame 5. And instead of having this smooth sinusoidal curve, I will just push it up just to make the transition a little faster just after the contacting pose. So I contact with the ground. I want to pull the back leg. So I will accelerate and I will do the same on the opposite side. After frame 20, I will simply add another key or duplicate a key on frame 25 and push it toward the next position. And this curve profile, at least for the time being, feels good to me. Now, what is disturbing is the tail following the rotation. 
it currently feels like there is too much motion, but this is because we haven't animated the tail yet to give it a follow through animation. But what we can do is isolate the rotation of the tail. Please make sure that you have the latest version of this rig that was updated on the 28th because the property wasn't exposed on the first rig release. In the properties panel on frame zero, I will set the tail rotation follow to zero. You can see it's interpolating. So we need to get rid of the keys that are not needed or not used to drive this property. In the graph editor, enable show hidden option. And then in the search bar, just type in prop and all the properties should appear. It worked that way on this specific rig because the properties are bound to a bone that is called properties. So I will just get rid of the keys of the tail follow and just keep the first one that is setting uh, the property to zero. With that fixed, let's jump onto the twisting of the hips. The principle is pretty close to what we did before, but I want to add some impact. As the foot will touch the ground, it will push the hips up. This is the kind of mechanism you want to exaggerate to have a very feminine walk cycle, for example. On frame zero, the left leg is contacting the ground. On frame three, I want to extremely push the hips up. Then Bob will recover from his own weight and he will start twisting the hips the opposite way to be able to raise the right leg. So I will start to twist the hips the other way, basically counterclockwise this to raise the right leg and then I will rotate them clockwise but not too much to reach the ground to help Bob reaching the ground with the right foot. And as he contact the ground, three frame later, I will re-rotate or retwist those hips counterclockwise pretty brutally to have this kind of shock or shaking in the hips as his weight is getting on it. So you can clearly see in the graph editor on frame 20, I have my contact pose and then I'm just raising the hips the opposite way. And we have this little bump on frame 25. So now Bob just recovered and he needs to raise his left leg. So I will rotate the hips clockwise until I reach the up pose. And then I will slightly rotate counterclockwise to reach the contact pose. So the base curve will be pretty sinusoidal, but we're adding this bump on frame 3 and frame 25 to break the rotation. And it does feel pretty cool. Let's work a bit on the X rotation. I will try to keep it simple. When he's reaching the contact pose, I will just move the hips forward a bit. So I will rotate them inward. Basically, I will raise a bit the curve value on frame 0 and frame 20. And then six to eight frames later, I will push the curve a bit down and it will make the back or the hips raising backward, a bit like a cheetah running if you want. But here we keep at this rotation pretty subtle because it's clearly not a cheetah, it's a little bigger. And I don't want to add too much of this rotation because it will bring too much noise to this area and I don't think that will be super accurate motion wise. We will add a lot of shaking and details and stuff like that but I have to be careful with the rotation because if I push it too far it won't look natural. So here it's a bit poppy, I feel like it, it switches a bit fast so I will just slightly offset frame 6 and frame 26 by one or two frames. By doing that, I'm smoothing the curve and I reduce the contrast in this motion. In the end, I switched to frame 7. Here it's frame 8, so it's a bit too smooth, but I did modify it off camera. One last detail I'd like to add to the hips motion is the Y location, so basically the up and down. And what I would like is to bring more detail to the down pose, so basically the impact and the weight of the character. So you don't really need to add this motion because there will be a lot, but again, it's a matter of detail. So what I want is a drop of the hips just after the down pose. So while the character is going down from frame zero to two or at the end of our motion, the hips will raise, it will offset up and one or two frame after the down pose, the hips will reach their lower point. Basically, they have a follow through motion with a settle. 
So after this bounce, they are trying to stabilize. But since we have two bounces in such a short cycle, they don't have that much frames to stay still. So as usual, I'm working on the first half of the cycle, since I will be repeating the same motion twice. Once I got something that felt satisfying, I just duplicated it, making sure that it blends properly. And then I just tried to offset a bit some of the keys just to see how it feels on the screen. So that's not the most interesting part, but you have the result right in the middle of the screen now. I now want to work on the chest. So I will select it and I will work on the up and down rotation. So the X rotation. I will probably add a bit of up and down also using the location later on. So as usual, I will hide all the control channel but the X rotation and just check how my curve behaves. The process is going to be pretty straightforward since I'm just doing overlapping motion based on the root motion. I mainly want the chest to drag. So on frame zero, we are into the down pose. We are going down pretty fast. So I am raising the chest. We hit the down pose around frame four or five. So I will go even lower on frame seven and I will consolidate the frame on frame three. So basically I'm holding the chest up and then after the down pose, the chest is dragging down. Since this is an up and down motion, it will occur twice during a cycle. Therefore, I can duplicate the keys and offset them by 20 frames. Here I'm trying to add a bit of contrast so that we better spot this motion. The curve is currently resetting, getting to a value of 0 on frame 12, but I will offset this value by one frame earlier so that we have a little more contrast. It's pretty subtle, but that should show. From there, I can duplicate the first half of my animation onto the second half to make it cycle. Now we will bring a bit of twisting to the chest. If you animate a walk cycle before January, you have what we call a counterpose or a contraposto between the chest and the hips. So let's add that. So as usual, when I don't know which channel I have to use, I just check the different curve, move them a bit and see how my character is behaving. So the Z curve is the one I want to play with. So basically what I want is when the left leg is pushed forward, I want to rotate the chest clockwise. It will basically raise the opposite shoulder. And when the right leg is forward, I want to rotate the chest counterclockwise. Our contact poses are on frame zero and frame 20. So it's pretty straightforward. I will just push the rotation on those keys. Then I will get rid of any keys that are unwanted because we don't really need them. Duplicate the first key on the very last frame since they have to be the same. And then I will simply scale my handles so it will contrast the curve. Note that by default, I'm generally using the individual origin as a pivot point to edit my curves. All right, now I will do exactly the same thing, but with the Y quaternion rotation, but I will make it more subtle because it's the side to side motion and I don't want uh, the chest of the character to wobble too much. Again, it's about finding the right balance between fighting against the weight of the character where he's trying to resist or lead his motion and showing control. So I have my subtle curve set up here and I will just offset it a bit to the left. So basically the chest is anticipating what the hips are doing. As in a walk cycle, you will move your shoulder forward to give yourself some momentum. The hips lead the animation, but so does the shoulders. They give momentum too. Once I'm happy with the result, I will just keyframe zero. Press V to convert the key to free and I will duplicate it on frame 40 and and remove the keys that isn't wanted. Great, we are almost done. Let's jump onto the head. I thought I set the head to use the inverse kinematic mechanism, but when I test it, it doesn't work. So I will just go onto my properties on frame zero, switch to inverse kinematic for the head. Then I will search for my properties into the graph editor and I will get rid of all the other keys. As explained previously, to do so, I switch to show hidden and then in the search bar, I'll search for prop. I will isolate the inverse kinematic switch for the head and I will just get rid of all the keys, but the first one where I'm setting the mechanism. From there, I just tested whether I should keep the inverse kinematic to follow the torso controller, also known as the center of gravity. 
as it means that I will have to counter animate the position of the head based on the torso. But the torso motion also brings a lot of interesting details to the base motion of the head. So in the end, I choose to keep it parented to the torso. Then I will get back and select my head controller, get rid of the prop in the research so that I can display my transform channels. And I will first work on the back and forth motion of the head. It's the Y location channel. Basically, I want the head to go backward when Bob is making a step when he's pushing on his leg and then the head should go forward when he's going down. So as you can see on frame 5 I slightly push the curve down just to set my extreme forward pose and then during the passing pose I will push the head backward. Once I have this space set up I will simply duplicate the keys to make it cycle over 40 frames. I dropped here the profile of the finer curve because I fought with it quite a lot to get it right. But there is not that much to say about it, you know, I'm just trying to contrast a bit the motion and keep it subtle and natural. As I felt the motion was a bit too strong, I selected all the points on my curve and then I switched my pivot point for the graph editor to use the bounding box center. This way I can scale the curve along the y-axis to reduce the amplitude of the curve, reducing the amplitude of the motion. Once I'm happy with that, I will key the very first frame, set it to 3 as usual, then duplicate it on the last frame and get rid of all the unwanted keys. And here I am with my base back and forth motion for the head. So let's now switch to the up and down motion. I will keep it super subtle. So basically I will raise a bit the head on frame 0 when it starts to getting down. And then on frame 7 also, I will lower a bit the head just after the down pose. So it's a very subtle overlapping motion. And then I will simply duplicate those keys to make the cycle. Now on top of this, we will add a bit of X rotation. So it's going to be a bit of the same principle. I will enable the X rotation. And basically we want the nose to point up when the head is going down. And when the head is raising, we want the nose to point a little down. So we are making the nose dragging a bit. And I'm as working on the curve, I will favorize the down pose of the nose. So the moment where the nose is pointing down. What I mean by that is that I will add a third control point on the cycle and make sure that the curve is mostly on the top value. So I will hit the higher value where the nose is pointing down just after the down pose and then I will kind of maintain or hold this pose while the head is getting up. So we are close to the up and down motion of the Z location curve but I'm bringing a bit of contrast. Once I'm happy with the result, I will select all the points and I will scale my curve down. So basically I will flatten it a bit to make the motion more subtle. You just need to scale down all the points along the Y axis. I will now check the rotation in front view and work on the Y quaternion rotation. Here I don't want the head to drag because it will look weird. It will be like Bob is not controlling his head. So think about the head as a wheel and I will rotate the head toward the point it's moving or it's translating. So when the head is moving to the right, I will turn the head to the right. And the head is anticipating the motion. This is why I offset my extreme by a couple of frames. It has to be a very subtle motion. You all seen those videos of birds and again, we do believe that this character should have a bird behavior where the head is stabilized in space. And this is probably due to the fact that birds can't really rotate their eyes. So if the head was moving around all the way, they wouldn't be able to focus on the point or have a clear view. So we brought some follow through animation through the location of the head and the up and down rotation. Now I'm kind of stabilizing the head with the others rotation channels. This is something you could also achieve with a target, for example, or a dump and track constraint. But that's also quick to do it by hand on such a short cycle. I will do the same thing with the Z rotation. So basically, I'm trying to get 
the most extreme side position of the head and I will slightly rotate the head inward. The extreme was on frame 9, so if I go to frame 29, I should find the other extreme. And again, I will push the head slightly inward so that the character is looking toward its center line. And so far it looks pretty good, so now I will work on the jaw. I do believe that closing Bob's mouth should look a little better. Then you can just block the pose and keep it as it is or add a very subtle motion because on a cycle if you add too much mouth motion it will look weird. In the rig UI I will enable the face controller layer. I will select the jaw controller and in the graph editor I will isolate the X quaternion rotation that will allow us to close the mouth. So I will push up the curve and then I will just get rid of all the other keys and duplicate this key over the last frame. Closing the jaw or the mouth really changed the silhouette of our character and it seems that he's looking up. So I will just select the head go on to the X rotation of the head and offset the whole curve just to make the head look down a bit. So next time you do such an animation, you should pose the mouth first so that you don't have to go through uh, this fix. Back onto the jaw, I will add a bit of motion, but it's going to be a very basic follow through animation. And I want it to be very noticeable because when you're walking, your jaw move for sure because everything in the body is connected, so it will look a little more alive or fleshy. But unless you're watching a clip of someone walking in very slow motion, you will not notice this motion in the jaw. This is why I told you before, once the jaw is posed, you can almost skip this step. It's up to you. I'm not even sure you can see the difference here on the screen. So let's work on the tail. I will display the relevant bone layer and I first want to work on the up and down rotation, the X rotation. I will start by animating the tail's root and then we will animate each joint along the chain. We need to keep this animation very subtle because the tail is used for balance. So it's not like a ponytails or hair where it could move over the place. There is tension in the tail muscle and we need to feel it. If you're feeling lazy, you can just animate the tail root and then the master controller. Just use a slight offset. I will show you how we can quickly animate the whole tail manipulating each joint. The tail root will have a lot of rotation, especially the up and down rotation, and then we will dampen or absorb the rotation along the tail. And then I may increase a bit the rotation on the last three or two joints of the tail. So the middle of the tail will absorb the bounce, while the tip of the tail will shake a little bit because it's uh, lighter basically, and it's not that involved into the balance of the character. Now, as a lot of our animation so far, this is going to be a simple follow through animation. So when the character hit the down pose, I will make uh, the tail go down super quickly a few frames after. And then the tail will stabilize back up and I will hold the pose so that we have a nice contrast. So at this stage, it's pretty easy to get a decent result. And then it's all about tweaking the curve, kind of polishing it to get a better result, something that feels better with more weight and more contrast. So if you lock a pose by creating two keys, one close to the other, as I'm doing here on frame five, you can see that my curve is almost flat and then it goes down very fast. I'm creating contrast, but then the down pose is smoothly getting up. So it's not like a hard bounce. The tail will go down quickly, then recover slowly and hold. It doesn't feel like it's hitting a wall or whatever. With that done, I will select the curve and press Ctrl C to copy it. I will select the next controller, isolate the X quaternion rotation, get rid of all the keys but the first one, and press Ctrl V to paste the curve. Then I will offset the curve by a couple of frames and I will repeat this along the whole tail chain. Then you can play with the scale of the curve, increasing it or reducing it to increase the amplitude of the motion. You can get rid of some of the keys because as further away from the root we are getting, the smoother the curve will be. 
And in the end, you will see that I got rid of most of the point to keep only four points per bone. And I just played with the amplitude and the offset of the curve. So I copy again the curve, jump into the next joint, select the x quaternion curve, get rid of all the keys but the very first one, paste my curve, and now I'm offsetting it even more. So I was kind of arbitrarily offsetting the curve each time by a couple of frames, sometimes a little more, and in the end, I just took all the curve and started repositioning them. So most of the time, I had one to two frame of offset between the joints. So I just accelerated the video a bit because I'm doing exactly the same thing over and over on each joint. You don't need it to be super accurate, just paste your data, offset them a bit, scale them a bit. Once all the joints are keyed, you can play with the curve. So I will just skip this part and here you can see the curve profile I had for almost all the joints in the chain. I got rid of the holding frame I had on the root of the tail. I kept it on the first two bones, but on the next bone, I just created this sinusoidal shape and I was just offsetting in time a bit the different keys, scaling them up or down depending on the behavior of the tail. So here I'm taking advantage of the cyclic modifier. I didn't key the very first and very last frame on each bone. I just offset them. Once I will be happy with the tail motion, I will properly cut uh, the animation. But I'll do it once we have animated all the rotation axis. So here I am with a decent result where I try to add more motion to the tip of the tail. So let's now play with the other axis. So I will repeat the process with the Z rotation axis and you will see that it will really bring our tail motion to another level. We paste our previous motion, the up and down rotation if you want, on the up and down of the torso of the root of our character. So I had a bit of contrast in the rotation on the X channel. Here I want something really smooth. I just need to find the right timing, the moment where I'm hitting the extreme down for the curve and the extreme up. And basically I'm just counter animating the rotation of the hips. So I will keep my curve in auto clamp. I will just move the keys and create a nice sinusoid. Then I will copy and paste this curve again and again over all the tail joint and offset them in time. Once my tail root motion is OK, what I want to focus on is keeping a nice curvature on the whole tail. I want it to have a smooth S shape. And as explained before, I don't want crazy extreme amplitude of motion because the tail is used for balance. So it has to be a tight S shape. So it took me like two to three minutes to get it right, at least right for me. Just really focusing on the shape of the tail at different stage of the animation. So I'm just controlling the shape, go to frame 15, offset a bit the curves, See if the root is properly aligned, if I get this nice curvature in the silhouette, and that's it. So, so I can't tell you, yeah, just put a key on this or this frame or whatever. You really need to, to get to this point where you play with the curve until you get this result or a result that fits your uh, walk cycle rhythm. You can add a super subtle twisting playing with the Y quaternion rotation. I won't do that because a tail can't really twist that much and it will make this long tutorial to last forever. To keep it simple, we will animate the arm using the inverse kinematic controllers. So I enabled the corresponding layers. There is a couple of bones that are not used. So I will just press H to hide them. Those are bones that are supposed to be hidden. Basically, they are useless for you. I want to switch the mechanism to inverse kinematic. In the rig properties, I will switch the value of the arm IKFK to zero on both arms. Now they are using inverse kinematic. I will search for my properties in the graph editor as we did before. I will isolate the IKFK curve and I will just get rid of all the keys after key zero because they are useless basically. 
By default, the end inverse kinematic controller are parented to the torso root, so there's already an offset with the chest that feels pretty good. My goal now is just to add a little more offset in the hand motion, first working on the Z location of those bones and simply making them drag a bit based on the up and down motion of our character. So as we did several times before, I will first work on the Z location curve. Here by mistake, I was manipulating both the X and Z location. So I got rid of the useless key later on. When the chest is going up, I want the hand to drag a bit so they would go down. And when the chest is hitting the down pose, a couple of frames later, the end will go even lower. Based on their size, we can assume that the arms were not used that much into uh, the walk cycle, basically to keep balance or add momentum. But you don't want them to wobble too much. If the motion is there and is accurate enough and you make it subtle enough too, it will be believable. You will aim for something pretty realistic. Now, if you want to do something very stylized, you can bring more contrast into this motion that will give a very goofy look to your character for sure. As we did before for the up and down cycle, once you have the first 20 frames that are okay, you can duplicate them on the next 20s because the up and down will occur twice in a cycle. We can now work on the side to side motion of the hands. So basically the X location curve. And here again, same principle, I want a simple follow through animation. So as the body is going to the left, the arm will drag right. So let me increase a bit the pace here because it's not super interesting. An important point though, I didn't use the motion path that much for this animation because I'm pretty used to create this kind of full cycle. But here I had some up that it felt like the hand was hitting a wall. So basically that it would raise too straight at some point. So I just enabled the motion pass, pressing Q and calculating it. And you can see that I have a nice curve. So what you don't want is to have straight lines into the motion. Otherwise it will feel like the hand is stuck in space. It's hitting an imaginary wall and you don't want that. My initial motion path was okay, but I just pushed a bit the left to right motion to get more curvature. As for the foot, we will animate one hand fully and then we will transfer the animation onto the other. But we won't be mirroring perfectly the timing. The idea is to create a slight offset so that it will feel more natural. Just as a test, I will copy uh, the curve I just created, go onto the other hand, get rid of all the keys, but the first one and press Ctrl Shift V to mirror the animation. And now I will offset it by 20 frames. So now the hands behaves properly, but then I will just add an arbitrary offset of two frames just to get rid of what we call twinning. It's when you have two elements that moves exactly in the same way. So we'll fix that by simply offsetting a bit them in time and maybe moving a couple of curves. But now what I want is to add a bit of rotation in my hand. So I will start with the X rotation. Again, it's the up and down rotation. So as usual, I will do the same thing. I will make the tip of the fingers to drag compared to the position of the wrist. The little nugget here is that I will add a slight bounce in the rotation. Instead of having a very smooth curve, once I've set up my main up and down pose as we've been doing as usual here, I will create a little bump that will create a slight jiggle in the fingers or the hand motion. So on frame 9, instead of blending toward frame 20, I will just duplicate the frame 20 and push it to the left and go down. So I create this little bump and this will create this shaking motion in a way. And since this is an up and down motion, it cycle over 20 frames. So once I have my first 20 frame, okay, I can duplicate them over the next 20 frames. From there, I just move the down pose by one key to make it smoother because it was bouncing a little too much. From there, I just switch to the Z quaternion rotation, which is the inside and outside motion. And I repeated the process. This axis cycle over 40 frames. 
So we should have a very smooth curve, but again, I will add a slight bump to it. So you will have this uh, nice shaking in the hands. So you can see that instead of having a S curved shape around frame 40 and frame zero, I'm just pushing the curve up a little bit to create a little bump. So I'm still in the lower values of the curve, but there's this little bump that will just, you know, create this shaking motion. You can bring a bit of twisting playing with the Y rotation if you want. I will keep it as is. My hand motion is done, so I will unhide all the channels, select all the curve, copy at them. Then on the other hand, I will just reset what I did. I will key all the channels on frame zero and get rid of all the other keys. And then I will press Ctrl Shift V to paste mirrored. And then I will offset all the keys by 20 frames and then offset them back by a couple of frames. Assuming that the motion is OK, to even break further the twinning, you can take a couple of transform channels and slightly offset the curve along the Y axis. So here, for example, I'm moving the Z location curve slightly upper than the opposite arm and it will break the symmetry in the character. From there, you can clean your animation curve. So I will duplicate all the keys, move them back by 40 frames, then key all the controllers on frame zero, switch to free, duplicate those keys on frame 40 and get rid of any keys before and after frame zero and frame 40. We haven't done that on the tail, so don't forget to do it on the tail. I will repeat the process with the fingers. So I will start with the left hand. You don't need to be super accurate. Again, it's just about creating a follow through animation. So I will start with the X rotation of the pan bone or the main finger bones. Instead of hiding the transform channel I don't want, I will simply type in the transform channel I want to work with. And then basically I will just edit both a curve at the same time, just to save a bit of time. Then it's up to you, you can slightly modify one of the two curves again to break the twinning in the fingers. So here you realize how much time it takes to add those extra details. There are other methods to do it, maybe use a bit of physics simulations or stuff like that. But basically here you don't need to be super accurate. What you do want is not to go into transformation or hand pose that are not natural, for example, overextending the fingers or over curling them. So here, basically, I'm countering the end pose. I'm creating an overlapping motion. We did that like so many times in this animation. And then I will repeat the process with the curl uh, controllers for the fingers. For me, it's always better to separate the root motion of a chain, for example, the fingers or the tail. The root of the tail should move differently from the next joint. But then you can use a controller for the next joint that move them all at once. So this is what I'm doing right here. I just animated the root of the finger and now I'm creating an overlapping motion of the next joint on the fingers based on this motion. It's a good time to create the bounce effect we talked about just before by, you know, modifying the curve and not making it too smooth. It will bring texture to your animation. So I just sped up a bit the video because it will take so much time, but you can feel it, I guess, even in this time lapse. And once I was done with that, I got back to the pound bone and rotated them along the Z axis, but a very subtle rotation. The next joint, if you take your fingers as a reference, the root of your finger can rotate almost around all the axes, but the next joint can only rotate around one axis. So you don't need to then uh, propagate this overlapping motion onto the next controller, basically. Once you're done, just copy and paste the mirrored action onto the other fingers and don't forget to offset them in time a little bit. That was definitely a lot of work for those little details. Now we will add even more details by using different tweaker bones, using the pulse haggets. We will bring the fleshiness of this big body. So I'm sure you will love this part. We will start to bring some motion in the muscle of our character. 
the flesh, the fat, whatever you want to call it. And it's actually pretty simple to achieve. You just want to bring a bit of bounciness and noise to the different tweakers controller. And we will start that with Bob's biggest muscle, the thigh muscle. So we'll be using those tweaker controllers. We'll use a very simple curve shape of bouncing or spring motion to drive the up and down motion and the twisting of those tweaker controllers. So while I'm isolating the proper transform channel, have a look to this curve. You start from zero, you reach a high value, and then you have some dampening happening. So basically, it's just the sinusoid that lose length over time. So with the first controller selected, this is the shape I will be creating for the z quaternion rotation. It will create some twisting motion on the flesh. So it doesn't show that much from this angle, it shows way more from the front view, so then I will scale down the curve so that the amplitude of the motion is way smaller. Once I'm done with the left leg, I will copy and paste the same motion onto the other leg, but since uh, this motion is driven by the impact of the leg, I will offset it by 20 frames. So I will just copy the few keys I have created, select the other controller, directly go to frame 20, get rid of the keys that I don't want, and press Ctrl Shift V to paste mirror. Then I will switch to the Z location channel, the up and down of that muscle, that controller basically, because it's there to control the base of the femoral bone, but who cares, we are using digital bone to move a digital flesh, so we don't care if what's inside is not accurate, what you want is to have a good visual result. So from there I will take my Z quaternion curve, I will copy those keys, and then I will switch to the Z location curve, and I will paste them. Now I have this spring motion, but the problem is that the bone is raising after the impact while it should be going down. So I will simply flip the curve. I will make sure that I'm using the 2D cursor as a pivot point, and I will press S to scale, Y and minus one to mirror the curve along the X axis. Now I can copy those keys onto the other bone, but on frame 20. I will then make some cleaning because I have some offset on my curve. And look how nice it now feels. The world feels way heavier and fleshy. Well, now we will simply pick this curve and paste it a bit everywhere on our character. So I will just speed up a bit the video because this is exactly what I will do. I just copy the current curve shape. I will choose the next controller, in this case the shoulder controller. I will try to find which channel makes the up and down motion, in this case the Y channel, and I will simply paste the curve. Then, depending on the kind of control channel you're using, Euler rotation, location, or quaternion rotation, the range of values might differ, if it's in degrees or in radian, for example. So once you've paced your curve, what you have to do is scale it down or scale it up, basically increase the range of motion to see a result. Here, for example, I want the up and down on this spine tweaker, but if I push it too far, the top of the back will also move and it won't look natural. I just want a super subtle shaking, so I will scale it down a lot. Now, if I switch to the calf muscle, for example, they are using Euler rotation in degrees. So our usual zero to one value for the quaternion won't show that much onto this bone. I paste my curve as usual, but I can't really see any motion. So I will simply scale it up a lot. So remember that your curve are just outputting a value, then it converted to degrees or centimeters or meters, whatever. So here we have a range of zero to 20 degrees. That's not a big deal. But if you do that on a location, it's going to be 0 to 20 meter, and that's a lot. That's why you may need to scale the curve. Also, remember that you may also need to flip the orientation of the curve. Now we have a couple of lovely tweaker controller, the belly controller and the throat controller, that are just here to be able to move the fat.
So it wasn't keyed at first, so I just keyed it. And now I will paste my curve. So you can see that the bounciness I used before looks very stiff for these parts of the body. To soften the motion, I will simply scale my animation over time, basically increasing the spacing between the keys, and I will also scale up or smooth the curvature so that it doesn't look as triangulated as is right now. I will simply uh, scale the handles and it will create a smoother curve and therefore a smoother animation of the belly. So time to time you may have to tweak the curve, right? really tweak them uh, against just pasting them. But really it's super fast. It took me like six or seven minutes to go over the whole character and do what you're seeing right now. With my belly fat animated, I can now just paste the curve onto the throat fat and then I will simply scale it down so that I don't have such a broad motion. I will do that also with the middle of the neck, the neck tweaker, with the same consideration as the middle spine tweaker. I will add the motion, but I will make it very subtle because this thicker bone also control the top part of the neck, so where the bones are, and it will look weird if the bones are shaking. Now, one last thing I wanted to add is a bit of motion into the knees. And to do so, I will paste the curve on the pole target of the knees. Basically, I want them to slightly shake left to right. So I paste in my curve for the first knee or the first pole target. I will scale it up until I get a nice result. And you can see the knee slightly shaking. So I know that currently the animation is a bit upscaled uh, in speed, but you can still feel it and you can still check the animation at the beginning of the video. And then I will do the same with the other knee. And here is our animation, all wobbly and jiggling everywhere. As any art form, your job is never finished, but at some point you have to say it's good enough. But I just wanted to go back on a little something on the animation. And while I do think the result is super cool right now, maybe in a week I will spot a lot of little issues I would like to fix. But let's say it's finished and I will move on. But I wanted to refine a bit the rotation of the foot. As you remember in the beginning, I told you that I wouldn't rotate the foot as we were using the foot roll controller to do so. But what I want is just to spread a bit the leg when it's raised. So basically turn the foot outward while Bob is raising the leg. Foot motion in a walk is very complex. So adding this extra rotation feels a little bit more natural. Also, the pole target is parented to the foot controller. So as I spread the feet a little bit, it will also push the knee on the outside. And so it won't clip that much with the chest. This is a game character. This is not a cinematic character. So there is no flesh simulation and all this kind of stuff. And what I mean by that is that it's okay if you have a bit of clipping. But adding this little motion feels a little more natural and it brings extra detail to the current walk cycle. And what I done is that I didn't mirror the animation. I just animated this detail by hand on each foot separately. And the idea here is that I'm sure that the right leg and the left leg won't have the exact same motion. I don't think we will really spot the difference, but I don't know it's there, so I'm happy with the result. And this was basically the final touch I added to this animation. So you can see that it takes time, but not that much, to get a nice creature walk cycle. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and I will see you very very soon for a new tutorial.